Hello, I'm Michael Haidt from the Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver, Colorado. I'm excited to be here with you tonight as part of this online gospel meeting. I think this is an awesome idea, and I thank uh, the guys that put this together. I know that there's going to be Bible teaching uh, every night is the plan through, uh, I think, through the end of uh, April, maybe even into May. Uh, and so you can tune in here uh, on on this page on Facebook and see some awesome lessons over the next coming weeks. Uh, certainly right now we're dealing with a, a unique situation. I myself am on the ninth day of a, a self-quarantine. We had a trip to Israel that we just got back last Saturday. Uh, so I haven't left my house in nine days. So uh, it's nice to actually talk to some people other than my wife and my dog. Uh, and it's going to be fun to study the Bible tonight and and go through the Gospel of Mark. I hope you have your Bible with you. Uh, we're going to do this. I consider myself more a teacher than a preacher, uh, and so we're going to study through the Gospel of Mark tonight. Uh, so grab your Bibles and, and sit down and uh, enjoy some maybe some family time, and, and we'll look at the Gospel of Mark. Mark is a, a particularly powerful Gospel in my mind. Uh, it's a very personal gospel, and I think you'll see that as we study through. It challenges us spiritually, individually. Uh, it challenges us to uh, really a, uh, consider a couple of things. Uh, one is, who is Jesus? And that really is one of the major themes of the book. Uh, we'll explore that a little bit tonight. But also what it means to follow. Uh, following is going to be an important concept from the book, and that's one of the things that we're going to focus on tonight. But as we, as we get started in the Gospel of Mark, we need to kind of overview the book, kind of see what the, what the book is really all about. And one of the ways that we determine that is, is that we see a couple of words in this text that are the most frequently occurring words, and they are the words see and hear. Uh, between those two words, they appear over a hundred times in the book. And it is this idea of that we see the miracles of Jesus and we hear his authoritative teaching. We're going to see that in chapter 1. If you notice in chapter 1, verse 22, it said, They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching as one having authority and not as the scribes. He taught in a very different way. We're not going to explore uh, that in, in much detail this evening. But the idea was that they heard his teaching, and his teaching was different. He taught with authority in a way that the scribes didn't teach them. And so it stood out to them. So they heard. But the other thing that is really probably one of the keystones of the structure of, of the Gospel of Mark is the miracles, the, the seeing component of this Gospel. And Mark is actually structured in a very interesting way. The first eight chapters of the Gospel of Mark contain, depending on how you count them, contain 20 miracles. The second half of the Gospel of Mark, from chapter 8 through the end of the, the book, only contains six. And so it's really front-loaded with all of these miracles. Mark records miracle after miracle, teaching section after teaching section in the first half of the book. And, and when we look at how that's divided through the, the literally the very middle of the book, we start to realize that chapter 8 becomes this critical turning point in the book. And if you flip over with me for just a moment to chapter 8, it, you'll, you'll notice, and many of you are probably familiar with it already, uh, that that's the, the famous Peter's Confession section of the book. In chapter 8, uh, they're walking in, Caesarea, in the area of Caesarea Philippi, verse 27, and on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying, Who do people say that I am? And so he asks his disciples who the crowds are saying that he is, the crowds that are seeing his miracles and hearing his uh, teaching. And they answer, the disciples answer and say, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, uh, but others say one of the prophets. And he follows that with a more poignant question in verse 29 when he says, it conti he continued to question them, but who do you say that I am? You see, the disciples had been with him more than the crowds had. They had been with him from the beginning. They had followed him along. They had seen most of the miracles. Some of the disciples saw uh, some private miracles, which is an interesting component of the Gospel of Mark. Peter, James, and John 
see some miracles that others do not. But for the most part, the disciples have that have followed with him all the way along have seen all of his miracles. They've heard all of his teaching. And so the question becomes, if, you, if you've been with me this long, what, who do you say that I am? And, and before we get to Peter's answer, which I'm sure you're fami familiar with, I think it, that's an important place for us to stop for a minute and ask ourselves the same question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at what it means to make the same confession that Peter makes. Peter says, you are the Christ. And we, we see that in the text in verse 29. Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And then he warns them not to tell anybody, and he begins to teach them from chapter 8, verse 31 through the end of the book. Really, the emphasis is no longer on his miracles, but they're on these suffering statements. We have a number, uh, again, depending on how you count them, anywhere between eight and nine suffering statements. The first one we find is here in, verse cha in chapter 8, verse 31, when he says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. You'll notice it's kind of an easy way to remember them. If you look at chapter 8, verse 31, chapter 9, verse 31 as well. For he was teaching his disciples, telling them that the Son of Man must is to be delivered to the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. So chapter 8, 31, 9, 31. And the other one, the most significant one, is in 10, 33. If you look at chapter 10, verse 33, it says, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. So... The first half of the book is uh, about proving who Jesus is, helping Peter come to the conclusion that he is the Christ and helping us as modern readers of this gospel to come to a decision about who we think Jesus is. Uh, and we hear his teaching. We see his power demonstrated through the miracles throughout the first eight chapters of the book. And then we come to this, this pivot point with Peter where Jesus asked the disciples the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter makes the right confession. He says that Jesus is the Christ, and that would be right. The problem is Peter doesn't really understand the answer that he gives. And the, the way we can tell that is you'll notice that Peter gives the answer, you are the Christ. And then in verse 31, as I just mentioned, Jesus teaches them that he's going to be killed and die. But notice in verse 32 of chapter 8, And he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. If Peter really did understand what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God on earth, I don't think he would have taken him aside and rebuked him. Um, do we feel like we have the authority to rebuke God? The problem is that Peter still has this Jewish mentality of an earthly king that's going to come to power. And so when, he's, when Jesus tells them in verse 31 that he's going to die, Peter caring about Jesus and loving Jesus doesn't want that to happen. Also, because of Peter's theology about how the Messiah is going to come and kick out the Romans and take care of uh, the Jews and come to power, he doesn't see that as what's going to happen. And, and Jesus responds in verse 33 by turning around and seeing his disciples. And he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Notice why. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. You see, it's God's interest that Jesus would come and die and be the sacrifice for our sins on the cross. That was the plan from the beginning. That's the plan that Jesus is now revealing to his disciples. Now that they understand that he's the Christ because they've seen his power through all of these miracles, now that they have that intellectual assent that he's the Christ, he's going to teach them what it means to really be the Christ. And he's going to clarify in their minds what Messiah really means. In their mind, Messiah means earthly king, and that's not what it means at all. And so he's going to clarify that. And he says to Peter that you're setting your sights on, God, on man's interests, not God's. Now, that 
fact becomes an important component of this gospel throughout the gospel. We're going to look at this idea of setting our mind on the interests of men rather than the interest of God. Because as the title of this lesson was, was laid out, it, what I decided to talk about at this lesson was what it means to follow. And in the Gospel of Mark, one of the things that it means to follow is recognizing that we can't set our mind on man's interest. We have to set our mind on God's interest. If we're truly going to follow, then we have to concern ourselves with what God wants, not what we want. And so often that really is our problem. Jesus goes on after telling Peter that that's his problem by providing us with a, a, a lesson that I think is really becomes the crux of Christianity. If you notice starting in verse 34, he says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, so he brought the crowd in along with the disciples. So he's teaching everybody this truth. And he says, if anybody wants to come after me, he must do three things. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. You see, Peter's not following. Peter's leading. He has a, a mindset of what the Messiah is. And when Jesus teaches them that he's going to die, that doesn't fit Peter's model of the Messiah. So Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him and say, no, that's not the way this is going to go down, Peter We're, or Jesus. We're not going to allow that to happen. And Jesus says to Peter and to the rest of the crowd, if you want to follow, if you want to be a follower, then the first thing you must do is deny yourself. Now, the, the word there for deny self is really a fascinating word. It means to refuse to recognize yourself. When we look in the mirror, who do we see? Do we see ourselves or do we see God? I think it's interesting that Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. I think Peter got this, or Paul got this message, didn't he? That he no longer lived for himself, he lived for Christ. And so he no longer saw his life as his own, he saw it as Christ's life, living through him. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to teach us in this section. We have to first deny self, we have to take up the cross. Now, oftentimes we'll hear this section taught and preached as if those burdens that we bear, for example, right now, many of us are, are living in quarantine, we're sitting in our houses. We might be tempted to say, well, that's just the cross we have to bear. The, those burdens and those difficulties in life are not what Jesus is talking about here at all. The cross was actually an instrument of death. And when he says deny self and take up your cross, what he means is that we need to put ourselves to death. In Luke's account of this same statement, Luke adds the word daily. We need to put ourselves to death every day. We need to put our desires to death, deny what we want, and ultimately follow what God wants. And, it, and it's through that seeking what God wants and following him that we have the opportunity to truly follow and understand what following is. And one of the threads then that we see throughout the book is this idea of what it means to follow. From chapter eight, really through the end of the book, and I'm gonna kind of give away the ending a little bit, but ultimately through at least the crucifixion, what Mark does is he sets out a number of different scenarios where he shows some folks that are willing to deny themselves and some folks that aren't willing to deny themselves. He uses these object lessons to teach us what denial of self really looks like. And ultimately he's gonna use Jesus as the primary example. But the, the lessons go back much further than that and they actually all revolve uh, around this idea of want. Now we're gonna to get to that in just a second but there's another thread that we need to understand, especially at the beginning of this book, that, that factors in here to this idea of what it means to follow. Jesus comes into a first century culture that is really, uh, sometimes I think it's, it's very different than what we imagine it to be. And Mark uh, crystallizes that view of, of what we see in Judaism at the time of the first century. It, it's interesting that what Jesus comes preaching, and if you'll notice, if you flip back to chapter one, it says, the text tells us in verse 14 that Jesus comes preaching the gospel of God. 
Now, this is not the gospel of Christ. He's not talking about his own death, burial, and resurrection. As a matter of fact, he hasn't even told the disciples that he's going to be killed until chapter 8. But he comes preaching this gospel of God, and notice verse 15 tells us what the, the details of this gospel of God is. It says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus comes with this message, this gospel of God, this good news of God, and the good news of God is that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what does he mean by the kingdom of God? Ultimately, he means the church. Uh, once the church is established, that certainly functions as the kingdom of God on earth. But prior to uh, his, his death, burial, and resurrection, I think we see something a little bit different going on in the gospel of Mark. He's really talking about the reign and rule of God. Now, the way we know that is that Mark lays out for us a, a scenario, a situation within his gospel that really shows us that the Jews have taken the kingdom away from God. There are a number of things that, that show us that as we move through. The, the first thing that you'll notice is in chapter 2, the scribes and Pharisees challenge Jesus about a number of things. They start out challenging him in chapter 2, verse 18, about fasting. And you, you'll notice that in verse 18, he says, Why do John's disciples fast and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And so they're, they're measuring his spirituality and they're measuring the spirituality of his disciples by doing what they do. The Pharisees fast. The disciples of the Pharisees fast. The disciples of John fast. So why don't your disciples fast? You're not as spiritual as I am. You're not as spiritual as we are. They have... They have set a level to measure people's spirituality. But the problem with that is that fasting was never commanded by God to the general people. Once a year, the priesthood would fast uh, in the temple. Uh, but for the, the average person, the law of Moses doesn't command fasting anywhere. And so you can start to see that the Pharisees ha and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day, have established this level for spirituality that is their own. They're making their own laws. And it actually, you see that even more clearly as we move through the rest of chapter 2. Notice in verse 24. In verse 24, actually in verse 23, it's on the Sabbath, and the disciples are passing through the grain fields, and they're plucking the heads of grain. And you'll notice that the Pharisees, verse 24, were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful? on the Sabbath. A very important word here in chapter 2 is that concept of lawful. They're asking Jesus why his disciples are breaking the law. But the question becomes, whose law are they breaking? Certainly they're not breaking the law of Moses because the law of Moses allowed for people to pluck grain on the Sabbath, especially those that were in dire need. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses 24. We see that in Leviticus 23, 22, that, that they were commanded to leave a little bit of grain in the fields for those that were hungry, that they could go through and collect that grain. Now, they're not allowed to harvest uh, an entire field on the Sabbath. That would be work. But God allowed for some uh, level of gleaning the, the grain so that people that were in need could do that. But the Pharisees have modified God's law. They've added to it, and as a result, they're now measuring the spirituality of Jesus and his disciples, not by God's law, but by their own law. And once you start to make law, who's king of the kingdom? The answer becomes, we become king when we make laws that God didn't make. You see, who's allowed to make law in the kingdom? Well, the king is, and who is supposed to be subject to those laws? The followers of the king, the subjects of the king, follow the king. If it's his kingdom, then he makes the rules. And that's exactly what Jesus came preaching, that the time is fulfilled. It is time for God to take his kingdom back, in essence, chapter 1. The kingdom of God is at hand. The reign and rule of God is in your presence. And you need to submit yourself to the reign and rule of God. And so...
They are not doing that. They're adding to God's law. They're be, they've made themselves king. Notice it gets worse. At the beginning of chapter 3, Jesus is going to heal a man on the Sabbath, and they object to that. Uh, they are Notice they're watching him, verse 20, uh, chap, sorry, chapter 3, verse 2. They were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. That word accuse means to bring legal charges against him. They are looking to see if he will heal this man on the Sabbath. Now, I find it interesting. First of all, this happens in the synagogue. What should they be doing in the synagogue? They should be worshiping. But instead, they're watching Jesus to see if he's going to break the law. Well, again, whose law might he be breaking if he heals on the Sabbath? And the truth of the matter is, again, it's their own law. It's not God's law. There is no law in the law of Moses that say, says that a miracle cannot be performed to heal someone on the Sabbath. But in the Mishnah, when we look at, at, at the codified laws of the Jews, we, we understand that they had come up with this idea that unless somebody's life was in jeopardy, there was no reason to heal them on the Sabbath. And so you needed to wait until the next day otherwise you were working and clearly this man just simply has a withered hand he he's his life is not in jeopardy and so Jesus performing this healing on the Sabbath is a violation of their law even though it's not a violation of God's law but see once again don't we see that by enforcing laws that they've created rather than God has created who's become king of the kingdom they've become king and they need to be reminded that the kingdom of God is at hand. This kingdom belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. And as we move through this gospel, we see this elevate more and more. Flip over to chapter 7, and we'll see one more incident where the Pharisees came together. Uh, and notice in chapter 7, verse 1, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands. That is unwashed. And Mark goes on to include a detailed description of what this means. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing, notice, thus observing the traditions of the elders. Notice this is not a command of Moses. This is not a command of God. This is a tradition of the, the elders. And he says, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. Uh, and they do other such things like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. Now, this has nothing to do with wa washing dirt off your hands. Uh, as many as a, of us have been practicing over the, the last week or so, we've probably washed our hands more times in the last eight days uh, or the last couple of weeks than we have in the last year uh, because the government is, is reminding us how important it is to wash our hands. But we're trying to wash the dirt and the germs off our hands. This was a ceremonial thing that they did that allowed themselves to see themselves as clean before God. This has nothing to do with dirt and germs. This has to do with this ceremonial practice of, of washing their hands. And notice verse 5, the scribes and the Pharisees ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? Your disciples are impure, and the reason they're impure is because they're not doing what we're doing. They're not following the tradition of the elders. Now, again, this is not a command from Moses. This is not a command of God. This is something they've added to the law. But notice the, the, their level of enforcement. They're judging people based on whether you're spiritual or not, and actually whether you're even pure or not, not by God's standard, but by their own. And Jesus responds rather harshly, starting verse 6, when he says, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. You see, we follow more from the heart than anything else. Their lips said, we follow God. But the reality is, is that they've added so much to what God has said that they're really more interested in enforcing their own laws than they are God's. Notice Jesus continues in verse 7 and says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. 
You see, they were teaching as teaching, as doctrine, what they wanted, not what God wanted. And once we cross that line, once we start teaching what we want rather than what God wants, guess what? We become king of the kingdom. You know, when I've used this this before, I don't know how many of you remember the Imperial Margarine commercials. Maybe if you're as old as I am, you remember Imperial Margarine. And Imperial Margarine commercials used to be when I was younger, and I was real young when those were on, trust me. Uh, But when Imperial Margarine commercials were on, you put the bread on, the butter on the bread, and as soon as you bit it, there was this trumpet sound, bump, ba da ba and this crown would appear on their heads, right? They became king or queen of the kingdom. Well, the reality is that as soon as we start to make law, As soon as we start to teach as doctrine the things that we want versus what God wants, guess what? Bump, ba da ba We put a crown on our head. We make ourselves king of the kingdom. And Jesus came to tell them, no, it's not your kingdom. It's God's kingdom. And notice he continues in verse 8. We're in chapter 7, verse 8. And he says, the end of verse 7, teaching as doctrines the precept of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. You see, they were holding to their own traditions to the neglect of what God wanted. He goes on to say, you have become experts at setting aside the command of God in order to keep your tradition. And he goes on to talk about Corbin and how uh, they, they created this situation where they could Uh, claim that things that they had already given were reserved for God and couldn't be used any other way. Uh, And and we're not going to go through all of the details of that. But in essence, they weren't allowing people to honor their father and mother. They could say, even if their father and mother needed something, that what they have has already been given to God and they can't use it to help their father and mother. Uh, and, And so he says that they follow those traditions. But skip down to verse 13 real quick and notice he says you know starting in verse 12 you no longer permit him that man who claims his stuff to be Corbin to do anything for his father or mother notice thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition which you have handed down and you do many other such things as that these are just a few of the things that we were doing they were doing Jesus says that they were doing many such things like this, setting aside the commandments of God in order to to follow their traditions. And he said they had become experts at that, setting aside what God wanted for what they wanted. Now, again, if they are running the kingdom at that level, then they're doing what they want and not what what God wants. And that really becomes the problem, does it not? How often is our Christianity and our life determined by what we want versus what God wants? We have to ask ourselves that constantly, don't we? And I've really come to believe that this is the crux of Christianity. And it is the one thing that that prevents some people from following God and following Jesus is when we realize that we can no longer be in control of our own life. We can no longer lead ourselves we have to follow instead. Sometimes that's a price that we're not willing to pay because you know what? We like being in charge, don't we? We like deciding what we wanna do. As a matter of fact, we're seeing some of that even right now during this, this coronavirus crisis. We have a, a, a large segment of our, our society, the government is asking us to cooperate and maybe stay inside and. Uh, to try to help stop the spread of this. And we see on the news people that are outside uh, doing various things and news agencies will interview them and they'll say, I don't care what they want, I'm not gonna do it. I want to be king of my own life. And especially in our American culture, we've been taught that we're free and we are in this culture and it is a blessing that we have in in this country. But sometimes I think that gets in the way of our submission to God. We have been trained and taught ourselves so much that we get to decide. We, you know, there's an old Billy Joel song that I don't care what you say anymore. It's my life. Leave me alone. Well, the truth of the matter is sometimes we respond to God that way too, don't we? We kind of look to God and say, you know, I really don't care what you say. It's my life. 
Leave me alone. You can't judge me. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to, and what are we doing? Ba -ba -da -ba. We're putting the crown on our head. We refuse to recognize the truth that the kingdom of God is at hand, that God reigns and rules. And unless we're willing to submit to his reign and rule, we're never going to be part of the kingdom because we've created our own kingdom. If we're a king, guess what? We're in our own kingdom. We've made our own kingdom. We're not subjects in God's kingdom. We're kings in our own kingdom. And that's exactly the problem of the Jews of the first century. And that's exactly what Mark is trying to help us see as we move through this. So this idea of the kingdom of God in the gospel of Mark, this authority that we see from the Jews, this lawfulness, even though they're binding law that's not from God, is, is one of the major threads that we see throughout the gospel that teaches us what it means to follow. If we're gonna follow, we can't be lawmakers. If we're going to follow, we can't be the king of the kingdom. We have to be willing to let God be the king of the kingdom, and we have to follow. We have to submit to his reign and rule. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent, turn from your self-rule, and trust in the gospel. Trust in the reign and rule of God. And, and so we have this, this thread that leads through. Another way that we can see this thread, and I think it's probably the more powerful way that we see this thread, is you, the use of another key word in the book. There is a, a particular Greek word that is translated as want, or sometimes it's translated as wish. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. But it appears 25 times throughout the book. And it is, as I said, it is this word that's often translated desire or wish. The first time we see it is in chapter 1, verse 40. And it's interesting that Mark would use Jesus as the first example of the use of this word. Now, what the actual Greek word is isn't, isn't important. You just need to know that it often appears in our translated as translations as this word want or wish or desire. And you'll notice in chapter 1, Jesus is dealing with this leper. And in chapter 1, verse 40, it says, A leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, guess what? That's our word. In other words, if you want to, Jesus, you can make me clean. This leper believes that Jesus has the power, but he understands that if Jesus wants to, he can make him clean. And it says that Jesus was moved with compassion, verse 41, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I want to. I am willing, is what the, uh, the translation I'm reading from says. I am willing, be cleansed. And he cleans him. So Jesus wants to do for others rather than just himself. This is a leper. Some may say, I don't want to touch you. I might get leprosy. Jesus wasn't worried about that. Obviously, I don't think Jesus was at all concerned about catching leprosy. If he could cleanse leprosy, he's not worried about getting it. But he does respond that he wants to. He wants to help this leper. He has compassion for him, and he wants to help him. He does, Jesus isn't thinking about himself in this moment. He's thinking about the leper. And so he provides what the leper needs. And from there throughout this gospel, we see this played out differently. Flip over to chapter 6. The next major example of using this word is actually with, with Herod and Herodias. And we don't have time to go through all of the details of the story with Herod and Herodias. Many of it, you will be familiar with it. But in chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 19, um, it really starts back in verse 14. John the Baptist has been coming to King Herod. Herod has enjoyed listening to John. He recognizes, he says, the text says he recognizes uh, that, that John is a, a righteous and holy man. He enjoys listening to him. But John's message for Herod is in verse 18. And he says to Herod that it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, we're not going to get into all the details of that right now. But the point of the fact is that God was telling Herod, you cannot be married to your brother's wife. Now, we can look at Old Testament passages we can look at Jesus' teaching on marriage, divorce, and marriage and understand what, what John is, is getting at here. Uh, 
But the point is that John's message to Herod is that you can't be married to, to Herodias. She belongs to your brother Philip. She is your brother, brother Philip's wife. And notice in verse 19, it says Herodias had a grunge against him and wanted to put John to death. This message that John came preaching, even though it was from God, upset Herodias so much that she wanted to kill the messenger. She wanted to do what she wanted. She wants to be queen. She wants the authority. She wants the power. And John's message is, is potentially jeopardizing that. If Herod comes to believe John, he, he's got to put her away. He's got to separate that marriage. And she knows that. And so as a result, notice that word want is the word that we've been looking at. Herodias has a grudge against him and wants to put John to death. And as the rest of the story plays out, there comes a strategic day, Herod's birthday, where Herodias has his, her daughter dance for Herod. And he is so uh, energized, if you will pol politely use that word, uh, so energized by this young girl's dancing that he makes her a promise in verse 22 and he says, ask me for whatever notice, ask me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. Uh, and she doesn't know what to ask, so what does she do? She goes to mom. Now, what does mom want? Mom wants John the Baptist's head. And so she sends her daughter back in and in verse 20, she's uh, in verse 25, she says, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. It's what she wants. It's not, uh, and actually it's what her mom wants more than what she probably wants, but she asks for John the Baptist's head. And notice in verse 26, it says, although the king was very sorry, but because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests, he was unwilling to refuse her. That word for unwilling is the same word we've been looking at. It's the word want. He does not want to refuse her because of the oath that he's made in front of his dinner guests. And uh, if you go back in the context, you'll see that all the important people of his kingdom are there. He's made this promise in front of them. If he backs out on this promise, he's going to look like a weak king. That's going to be a problem for him reigning and ruling. And so he doesn't want to refuse her. Even though he enjoyed listening to John, and even though he thought John to be a holy and righteous man, what does he do? He has John the Baptist beheaded. You know, there's a, there's a lesson in that for us. When we want something bad enough, are we willing to deny what God wants in order to get it? Are we willing to finally submit to our own self, bum, ba, da, bum, put the crown on our heads, decide that we're a king, and do what we want rather than what God wants. That's certainly what Herod and Herodias did, and it took John's life. Well, we fast forward to chapter 8 in the passage that we just looked at at the beginning of this lesson. And in chapter 8, when, Jesus, when Peter makes the confession, Jesus says, you're setting yourself on man's interest, not God's. Uh, notice in chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus teaches then, if anyone wants to come after me, there's our word again. What do you want? Do you want to come after me? Do you want to follow? If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. You know, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, we've got to lose our life. We've got to give up the reign and rule of our life. We've got to be willing to put ourselves to death. That's what he had just said. We have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow. And we have to recognize that if we want to be disciples, if we want to be subjects in God's kingdom, we have to be willing to lose our life. We have to lose control of our life and give it to the king. We can't be king anymore. And so this idea of whoever wants to save his life must lose it is something that we all have to deal with. We all have to ask ourselves, are we willing to give up ourselves, to lose our life for God's sake and follow Jesus Christ? The next example we see is over in chapter 9 as we move through the text. In chapter 9, starting in verse 35 is when he makes the statement, but going back to verse 30, 
They've just come down off the Mount of Transfiguration. They're, they're walking. He has given them that suffering statement that we saw in chapter 9, verse 31. Uh, and verse 33, they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began asking them, what were you discussing on the way? You see, the disciples were having a talk with each other as they were walking along the way with Jesus. But they kept silent on the way. Why? They didn't want to answer Jesus' question, what were you talking about? And it says in verse 34, they kept silent for on the way they had discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. They were arguing amongst themselves about which one of them was puffed up and which one was better than the other. Isn't that what they want? They want to know who's the greatest. And notice Jesus says in verse 35, sitting down, he called the 12 and said to them, if anyone wants to be first, if you want to be first, what do you have to be? He shall be last of all and a servant of all. You see, they wanted to be first. They wanted to know who's the greatest. And how often do we do that, even in the brotherhood? Sometimes we talk about who are the greatest preachers in the brotherhood? Who are the best? Who, who's the best teacher? Who's the, the best gospel preacher? Who's the best this? Who's the best that? And when we do that, we're, we're setting the wrong standard. God is the best. Christ is the best and the greatest of all. And we measure ourselves against him, not against one another. And Jesus says, if you want to be first, you have to see yourself as a servant. You have to follow, not lead. Stop trying to be the greatest and be the least. And if you're the least, you'll be the greatest in the kingdom. And that thread runs all the way through this section into chapter 10. As a matter of fact, flip over to chapter 10, verse 35. Two of his disciples, two close disciples, James and John, come to him and notice in chapter 10, verse 35, James and John, two of the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Challenging question is, we want something, Jesus. We want you to give us something. It's almost as if James and John think they have a, a, a magic lamp. And they kind of rub the lamp. We want you to do for us whatever we ask you to do, Jesus. Who's in charge of that kingdom? You see, if they're, if they're asking Jesus to do what they want, if they want Jesus to be in subjection to their will, who's king of that kingdom? James and John are more than Jesus is. And the same thing is true in our lives. Now, we have the opportunity to ask Jesus for what we want. We certainly have the opportunity to go to God in prayer and petition him on, on our behalf and tell him the things that we want. We're going to see that Jesus does that in the garden. But are we willing to submit to him as king, or are we always looking to ask God for what we want? We have things we want, God. We're going to rub our lamp, and we're going to ask you to do what we want you to do for us. And, and notice Jesus' response. In verse 36, Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do? You see, Jesus is always looking to help others. Jesus is not about himself. He's always about others. He wants to help. And so he gives this opportunity for them and they say grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in glory they want power don't they and he teaches them that it's not this way in the church he asks them if they're ready to drink the cup that he's about to drink and what's their answer yeah we sure are because they think the cup that jesus is about to think is this physical kingdom jesus is going to become king of the physical kingdom and he says, are you ready to drink the cup that I'm going to drink from? And they're like, absolutely, Jesus. We want to sit at your right and left hand, and we want to come to power. He, he asks them, are you ready to be baptized in the baptism that I'm about to go through? And they say, you betcha, because they have this very physical kingdom in mind, and they, they're ready to go through that. And he tells them that it's not going to be that way. But notice in verse 43, he comes back. And after telling them that the Gentiles are the ones that want to lord over others. But it's not that way among you. In the church, it's not going to work that way. There's one king in the church. There's one king in the kingdom, and that's God. And Jesus has been appointed Messiah. He is going to sit at the right hand. It's not his to give. He can't give James and John the right and left because it's not his to give. It's God's kingdom. And God has already given or will give. 
that right hand seat to Jesus as the Messiah once he dies and is resurrected. And notice in verse 43, it says, but it is not that way among you. But whoever wants to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be a slave of all. One of the ways that we learn to, to be followers is to subject ourselves to the will of others, isn't it? We have to subject ourselves first to the king, recognize we can't be king. But second of all, that we're here to serve. We're here to serve others. We're here to put others before self and not be the leader of the group, but the follower. We need to look at the people around us, and especially during these times like we're dealing with right now, when, when our culture is challenged, when we ha we're having these difficulties, we need to put others before self and allow God to reign through us and serve just the way Jesus did. And he actually becomes the most powerful example of all. If you'll notice, as John, or as John, as Mark continues this, flip to chapter 14. As Mark has given all these examples of what people want versus what God wants, he gives us the ultimate example. And there are other examples that we could look at. The rich young ruler, what's his problem? He wants his riches more than he wants uh, to, to follow God. Uh, we have the Pharisees who, who like the chief seats in the synagogues and other, other issues. They, they want the power and the authority more than they want to follow God. But ultimately, Mark brings us to this crux in the garden. Jesus in the garden goes to pray. He knows that he's about to be arrested and tried and crucified. He's been telling the disciples this after the Lord's Supper, after the the Last Supper, they go into the garden, Jesus prays, and I want you to notice what he prays for. Starting in verse 35 of chapter 14, it says, And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. Jesus certainly knows why he came to earth. He came here to die for our sins. He's been telling the disciples that since chapter 8. So it's not that he doesn't know what he's, he's here to do, but the stress and the, and, and the anxiety of what he's about to go through, he goes to the Father in prayer and he asks if there's any way for this cup to pass from him. Now, I think he knows the answer, but he also wants to communicate with God. And I, I think he sets such a good example here for us. When we're distressed and troubled, and the text tells us in just... Uh, the previous couple of verses, verse 33, that he was very distressed and troubled, even says he was grieved to the point of death, verse 34. What does he want to do? He wants to talk to the Father. Guys, right now, a lot of us are distressed and troubled. We, you know, the road before us is, is somewhat unclear. This coronavirus, we're, we're experiencing things we've never experienced before. Well, certainly in no time in our lifetime has there ever been a shutdown like this, and it's not just here in the U.S., it's global. And that's causing some to be distressed and troubled. And what does Jesus do when he feels those emotions? He prays. Brothers and sisters, that's the most powerful tool we have right now in the times that we are facing. Is faced with distress and trouble, the first thing we should do is go to God and talk to him about what's on our mind and on our heart. We need to share with him what we want. None of us wants to walk the road that we're about to walk in our culture. Financially, there's going to be trouble ahead. This illness is going to get worse before it gets better as of right now. And none of us wants that to happen. But we may still have to walk that, that walk. And it's okay to tell God that. It's okay to talk to him and let him know what we want. To share with him what's on our heart. To share with him our distress and our trouble. But notice that what Jesus adds to the end of these, this prayer, verse 36, he says, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. You see, our prayer to God has to be your king of the kingdom. I'm not coming to you commanding or demanding that you do what I ask you to do. I'm not king of the kingdom. But I can come before you as your subject. I can ask you for what I want, but I'm going to tell you, God, in this prayer that no matter what I want, I'm going to do what your will is. 
I'm going to subject myself to you. I'm going to die to self. I'm going to deny myself and what I want, and I'm going to follow. And I'm going to allow you to lead me through whatever road is, is set before me. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And notice three times he goes to the Father and says the exact same thing. I don't want to do what I'm about to have to do. If it's possible, remove this cup from me, but not what I want, but what you want. And there's a, an interesting little aside here at the, in, in chapter uh, 14, verse 41. He returns to the disciples who have been asleep all this time. Each time he goes back to them, they're sleeping. And he says, uh, notice he says, are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. Now, some look at this and suggest that what he's saying to the disciples, it's enough of your sleeping. I don't think that's what's happening here. You may disagree with me and that's okay. But notice he says, it is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. And in verse 43, it says immediately while he was speaking. So as he is saying these words to the disciples, Judas and the crowd come up to arrest him. You see, I think when Jesus says it is enough, he's not talking about it's enough of you sleeping. He's talking about it's enough of asking God what I want. Now it's time for me to do what God wants. I've asked God if the cup can pass from me. You know what? I have my answer. The answer is right before me. Judas and the crowd is coming to arrest me. And God is saying, no, this cup cannot pass from you. You are going to have to go through this. And there is a calmness and a peace that comes over Jesus from this point forward that we need to take special note of. You see, when we subject ourselves to the king, it should bring calm in our life. It should give us a peace that surpasses all understanding, as Paul said. Because God reigns. God will guide us through. David was able to say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God can take him through that valley, even if it means his death. And the, the same is true for Jesus and brothers and sisters, the same is true for us. Are we going to ask God for what we want and live in that distress and trouble? Or are we going to say it's enough and recognize that as we ask, we're willing to do his will. And whatever road he sets before us, we can be assured that he will walk that road with us. He's going to help us. He's going to guide us through. And that's exactly the example that Jesus gives to us. Peter says in his epistle that Jesus kept on entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. Well, are we entrusting ourselves? Are we entrusting our lives to the king who judges rightly? The king who will guide us through. And you'll notice in all the gospel accounts from the garden forward, after this point, after Jesus is arrested, the text never tells us anything about Jesus' distress and trouble. It appears to be gone. Why is it gone? Because he trusts God. He trusts the Father to walk him through this path that he's got to take. And he can do the same thing for us. You know, we started this lesson tonight with what does it mean to follow? It means that we can't be king. It means that we have to put others before ourselves. We've got to look to what others want, not just what we want. But it also means walking the road that the Lord has set before us and recognizing that the Lord has given us access to him that is unprecedented in Jesus's time. When Jesus is crucified, the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom we now, as Christians in the church, have access directly to God through prayer. We can bow our heads. We can get on our knees. We can lay prostrate on the ground if we want. But we can talk to God directly and tell him what's on our hearts. And we can know and trust that he hears us and listens to us. Flip over briefly, and I know we're coming to the end, but I want you to look at, at 1 Peter. Peter's makes an assurance to us that I think we need to be reminded of here. And notice in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, he says, 
He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. We need to chase after peace. Well, how do we get that? Notice, for the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, if we're righteous, then the Lord hears and attends to our prayers. But righteousness throughout the gospel accounts and throughout the New Testament is subjecting ourselves to the reign and rule of God. We have to understand, and I think the, the gospel that Jesus came preaching at the beginning of the gospel of Mark is as relevant today as it was in Jesus' time. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. God reigns. You subject yourself to his reign, you can be part of his kingdom. If you refuse to, reject, to submit yourself to his reign and rule, if you refuse and put the crown on your own head, blow that trumpet, wear your own crown, you will not be part of his kingdom. You'll be part of your own. But if we, in righteousness, submit ourselves to him, doing his will day by day, he can guide us through. It really comes down to what do you want? Do you want to be a follower? If so, then you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and you have to follow. Brothers and sisters, we're about to go through some difficult times in this country and around the world, but God can see us through. Have the confidence and faith in God. Trust in him. Lean on him during these times. Lean on one another. Uh, maybe through these Bible studies. I hope you found this one encouraging tonight. But recognize that God reigns, and we must subject ourselves to his reign and rule. We can't be the ones in charge, and we need to trust him to guide us through as we go. I hope you have found this uh, beneficial tonight. Uh, as we finish up tonight, look forward to other lessons that will be coming throughout the, the coming days and weeks. Continue to tune in to this channel, if you will, on Facebook, and you'll hear a lot of good gospel preaching Continue to study your, your Bibles, continue to pray, continue to seek strength from one another in God's church, and may God bless you and keep you safe until we have a chance to be with one another again. Thanks for your time.